Today's first scripture reading comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 65. In this reading, God is speaking through the prophet about the final day of the Lord. The Christian associates, the Christian associates all this with the second coming of Christ. For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating, for I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it or the cry of distress. No more, no more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days or an old person who does not live out a lifetime, for one who dies at a hundred years will be considered a youth, and one who falls short of a hundred will be considered accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, or bear children for calamity, for they shall be offspring blessed by the Lord, and their descendants as well. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, but the serpent, its food shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Our second reading from the New Testament this time is from the Gospel of Luke. Chapter 21, for the second half of this gospel, Jesus is headed towards Jerusalem. And now for the last couple of chapters, he's actually been in Jerusalem, in the temple and near the temple teaching. We begin at verse five. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, Jesus said, as for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. They asked him, teacher, when will this be? And what will be the sign that this is about to take place? And he said, beware that you are not led astray. For many will come in my name and say, I am he. And the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first. But the end will not follow immediately. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places famines and plagues and there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance. For I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed, even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends. And they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name. But not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. Ordinary time. In the world outside church, as in the world inside church, this means a time when nothing really special is happening. It's a time when we go about our work and leisure and rest in a fairly predictable cycle. In a way, there's nothing more precious than ordinary time. Time not marked by the stress of either big celebrations or big traumas. In church, 
Ordinary time is any time we are not in the midst of one of the two great cycles of the church year, the ones having to do with the big events associated with Jesus. Christmas, with its season of preparation, Advent, or Easter, with its season of preparation, Lent, which there's a typo, if anyone has looking at a, bulletin, at a, at a sermon. Everyone else, at least for us mainline Protestants, is ordinary time. Now today is the 33rd Sunday in ordinary time, and it's the second to last Sunday in ordinary time because preparation season is coming. Advent is just around the corner now, that time when we pray and prepare our spirits for our celebration of Christmas. But you may have noticed this about the readings. When ordinary time is coming to a close, our scripture passages get kind of funky, kind of wobbly, this and that, highs and lows, joys and sorrows, everything jumbled together. Take our passages today. Our passage from the Hebrew scriptures that Ryan read speaks to people living during, but right at the end of the time of the Babylonian exile. The exile was a time of terrible losses, including the loss of leaders, the loss of homes, the loss of families, the loss of the temple. But perhaps the greatest loss in the people's heart was the loss of the land. The great big Babylonian empire had swallowed up itty bitty Israel and Judah. So now, that land that God had promised them no longer belonged to the Israelites. It plunged them, God's people, into a grief it is hard for us to comprehend. But in this passage, the one that Ryan read, the prophet Isaiah tells them of God's promise for what comes next. And it's beautiful. New heavens and a new earth. Everything fresh and green, a place of abundance, plenty. New joys, Jerusalem, which had suffered so much sorrow, would now be a place of joy, the joys of no more disease, no more untimely deaths, of good, satisfying work. A place of peace. Peace after so much war. Peace after so much desolation and violence. Peace so profound, the central image, and we sang it and we heard it, is one of a wolf and a lamb feeding together. Predator and prey no more, but side by side in harmony. Peace. To people in a time of exile, Isaiah offers words of profound comfort and reassurance. But we followed that vision with a passage in which Jesus is in prophetic mode, and his words are shocking. During a stroll near the temple in Jerusalem, mind you, the very same temple that had been destroyed, that caused so much grief in God's people, and then had been built again after the Babylonian exile was over. That newly rebuilt temple. Jesus astounds his friends by saying, this temple too will be destroyed. The days will come, he says, when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. He follows these words by warnings of wars and earthquakes, famines and plagues. And a simple conversation about the beauty of the temple turns to visions of destruction. To people in a time of relative peace, Jesus offers words of warning and foreboding. These passages seem to be at odds with one another. And in some ways, they absolutely are a vision of plenty alongside a vision of destruction. But there is at least one element that binds them together. And the children heard the third reading, the one we're not using today, from the pulpit 
but one that binds them. The element that draws these passages together is work. Work, of course, is part of God's original design for humanity. Even in the Garden of Eden, the first perfect paradise, the first humans are assigned work. They are told to till and keep the garden. Maybe it's because God has been engaged in the work of creation, which God sees day after day is good, very good. And maybe God making humans in God's own image and likeness assigns them work because God knows how wonderful it can feel. God creates others to work alongside God, co-creators now of this brand new world. And so there's work to do even in the original paradise, even in the new paradise, the new heavens and earth described by Isaiah. And there's work to do in the midst of the looming disaster described by Jesus. God's people shall build houses and inhabit them, Isaiah writes. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. And then to clarify, he says, they shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. Because, of course, that's what happened to them in exile. People planted gardens and farms. People built houses, and then they were carried off. They were ripped away from their homes, from everything good and familiar, everything that even meant home. And other people ate that food. And other people lived in those houses. You can bet that was a story that was passed down the generations. But now God is saying that will be no more. My chosen ones shall long enjoy the work of their hands, is Isaiah's message from God. They shall not labor in vain. God's people will know the satisfaction that comes from doing maybe what they love or maybe for the people they love. Like God, at the end of each day of creation, they'll be able to look upon their work and say, it is good. This almost feels like a Thanksgiving text to me the goodness and beauty of doing what you love, followed by the ability to share the joy. Now Jesus speaks of work as well, but it's a very different kind of work. Jesus lays his prediction of this frightening loss at the feet of his companions, who immediately ask, when, what signs should we watch for? And Jesus, did you notice, refuses to answer these questions. Instead, he focuses on the work of discipleship that will follow. The work of being his follower that will be needed in these terrifying times. He describes still more disturbing events, persecutions, arrests, prison, but he offers counsel about how to live through such times. His followers will be given the opportunity to testify. So when I hear the word testify, years of law and order kick in. And I immediately hear the chung chung. And I see a courtroom and someone placing their hand on a holy text off in the Bible. Is it their left hand? Is it their right hand? I think they place their left hand on the text. Hold their right hand up. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. And the person replies, I do. And then if they're an honest person, everything they say should be the truth. This isn't that different. Jesus' followers may well be in courts of law before kings or judges, or they may be trying to talk to family members who just don't get this new Jesus thing they are involved in. Of course, that's the other of meaning of testify. For us, it can mean speaking our faith, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it's frightening. You will get a chance to testify, Jesus says, but he urges them not to worry about preparing. Rather, they should trust that Jesus himself will provide them with wisdom. Their work will be the work of endurance, enduring danger and evil, giving witness to the love of God shown in Jesus' way, 
This isn't going to be easy, Jesus says, but you will endure and you will be okay. Better than okay, because both these passages, as Ryan's introduction reminded us, in the end, look forward to that day when God will take all our brokenness and gather us together in creating new heavens and a new earth and a new us, a time when the home of God will be among mortals. We will be God's people and God will be with us and God will wipe every tear from our eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things, the former things, have passed away. Get ready for the new things. We walk through our lives mostly in ordinary time, the quotidian work of daily living. We go to the office or the shop. We put the clean dish on the rack to dry. We walk our laps, get our steps in. We say our prayers. We mostly are in neither completely dreadful times of loss nor in times of perfect peace and restoration, but we're somewhere in the middle, ordinary. But the same work that punctuates our every day is the work that can ground us when life gets hard. It is the very work, this very work, that opens us to unexpected joy, the satisfaction of doing what we love, doing it for those we love. The work God gives us to do is a precious gift. Through that work, the very work of simply being who we are called to be. God's people, Jesus' followers, infused by the Spirit, we will be able to not just get through, but thrive. Not just thrive, but find joy, find purpose. Find that we are always, in days of challenge and days of elation, held in God's gracious care. Thanks be to God. Amen.